Hey guys, no, no, you're not interrupting. We're just having an ordinary family celebration here. Namely, nice coffee, cookies and relative gossip. Well, and also my aunt's dog, which, as it seems to me, sometimes wants to kill me. In general, family celebrations for all of us are pretty bearable. Well, since relatives in most cases are really nice people. Well, at least those with whom we are acquainted. And what about those we've never met? Do you know who your great-grandfather and great-grandmother were? Huh? Imagine that you are holding your father's hand, and he in turn holds the hand of his father, who holds the hand of his, and so on. Statistically, in just 165 feet of this large chain of fathers, with a probability of 1 in 200, there will be a person whose name is hardly unfamiliar to you. Genghis Khan, the Mongolian conqueror. Without a doubt, he could have told much more interesting gossip than my aunts. After all, Genghis Khan wasn't the guy who gets stuck in the friend zone forever. Otherwise, how could we explain all the millions of his descendants? He had hundreds of children, who in turn gave birth to hundreds more children. This is probably why he was engaged in robbery, rushing across Asia, to be able to pay all his alimony. So, Y chromosomes are passed from father to son, without undergoing significant changes, and make it possible to trace the paternal lineage. So where did such a huge number of descendants come from? You can guess thanks to a controversial quote, the authorship of which is sometimes attributed to Genghis Khan. The greatest joy for a man is to defeat enemies, drive them in front of you, take away everything they own, see their loved ones in tears, and embrace their wives and daughters. I doubt it was enough for him just to embrace their wives and daughters. Genghis Khan is not considered a classic hero. A hundred children will not appear as a result of love affairs on the journey to the occasion of high school graduation. His descendants were also not lazy to reproduce, which is explained by the fact that men who had power could have several women. The Y chromosomes of 8% of all males in the wide region of Asia trace their connection to the Genghis Khan lineage. I will not argue that if your appearance lacks even the slightest Asian traits, then the chances of being a carrier of the conqueror's genes are extremely small. However, according to calculations, by 2003 the descendants of Genghis Khan made up a proud half percent of the total male population of the globe. So what if we don't limit ourselves to Genghis Khan, but move even further into the past along our chain of fathers? Much further. In theory, it can be extended to the very first life form in the world. Yet in practice, this attempt is doomed to failure since the chain will be broken for some individuals, whose number is approximately equal to the population of Pakistan. After all, it's damn hard to hold hands if you have fins instead of hands. And in general, have you ever seen two fish hold hands? For this, they simply lack a sense of romance. So, if we ignore this problem and arrange the rest of the ancestors like elderly spouses, that is, silently next to each other, then the chain will end somewhere on our first common ancestor. And this one-celled atom, who lived about 4 billion years ago, became a stage of transition from chemistry to biology. He was called Luca, the last universal common ancestor. No one knows exactly what Luca looked like or what hobbies he had, well, since there was no one to ask him about it at that time. No one even asked if Luca wanted to be born in the first place. This decision has already been made for him by carbon, completely shamelessly forming multiple bonds at the same time, well, and constituting the basic structure of life. This element has come a long way. It is forged inside massive stars and forms almost everything worth living for in this world, namely barbecue coal, diamonds and life itself. Proteins, fats, carbohydrates and many other substances floating in our cells have received carbon as their main structure. This is due to the fact that carbon is great at forming long chains and connections with other elements. These connections even have perfect power. However, the most important property of carbon is the variety of chemical structures that can form an element. In fact, carbon can form more structures than all the other elements in the periodic table combined. By the way, this is useful if you're going to make something as complex as life. In order to form a living being from carbon, it must first form organic compounds. We learned how they were formed back in the 1950s, thanks to the scientists Stanley Miller and Harold Clayton Urey. The two researchers modeled in a glass bulb the atmosphere that would have prevailed on the early Earth. 
water, methane, hydrogen and ammonia. Today, equally harsh conditions perhaps can only be found in sports locker rooms and maybe inside sneakers. These gentlemen provoked a mixture of electrical discharges in order to simulate the thunderstorms that often occurred in the young atmosphere. At the bottom of the bulb was an artificially created pre-ocean. A rather bombastic name for a puddle of water, right? But in fact, the experiment began to give interesting results after the primary atmosphere was exposed to electrical discharges for several days. The liquid began to acquire a pink color and when scientists examined it, they discovered something amazing in the primary atmosphere. Thanks to lightning discharges, organic molecules spontaneously formed, among which were acid sugars, fatty acids and amino acids. In the course of further experiments, with changing atmospheric conditions, other ingredients of life were recreated, including the structural elements of genetic information. So the next time you go down the subway and smell the methane gas with your nose, you should feel gratitude, because without it, there would be neither you nor the subway. Perhaps in addition to the pink protoplasm, Luca also received help from distant stars. After all, there are many regions in our solar system where conditions under which organic molecules can be created prevail. Therefore, meteorites are often filled with the building blocks of life, although they are just sterile boulders. For example, in the Murchison meteorite, weighing over 100 pounds that fell in Australia in 1969, 70 different types of amino acids were found, many of which are known from modern living things. A strong asteroid bombardment in the early stages of Earth's history could have become the very impetus that caused the emergence of life. As a result, not only many of the future components of the cell came to Earth, a huge amount of water was also brought to our planet. However, the origin of life can be facilitated not only by the contents of the meteorite, but also by the powerful impact. In 2015, scientists created a meteorite. It was a frozen mishmash of water, amino acids and silicates that was cooled to minus 320 degrees Fahrenheit. To simulate the impact, the cosmic snowball was bombarded with missiles. As a result of the impacts, individual amino acids combined to form short chains, as it happens in cells to form proteins. Therefore, the force of the impact itself can contribute to the formation of complex organic molecules, without which there would be no biology. What the primordial soup lacked for life was isolation from the outside world. The outer membrane, similar to the membranes of modern cells, arises spontaneously when amphiphilic molecules enter the water. Despite their name, amphiphiles have nothing to do with frogs. This word describes substances that interact strongly with water and also have a fat-soluble part. These include, for example, the phospholipids that make up your body's cell membranes. In the Murchison meteorite, amphiphilic molecules were also found. Upon contact with water, they demonstrated the ability to spontaneously form membrane-like structures. Therefore, all the components necessary for the emergence of life were available. But has the mystery of our origin been solved? Your kitchen probably has all the ingredients you need to make a delicious marbled cake. But notice how unpredictable it is to create a masterpiece of baking out of them. You will be disappointed, as marbled cake is an exquisite product. However, one day it may happen that the milk bag falls into the flower box and forms what might pass for the primitive precursor of the cake. The living things you know today are the product of a long development that took billions of years. Random genetic mutations, coupled with a relentless struggle for survival that allows only the best to reproduce, is a never-ending optimization process. As a result, over an extremely long period of time, something as complex as my aunt's bloodthirsty dog can develop from a primitive group of molecules. But that's all for today. It was Brock from Broccoli Academy and thanks for watching. Well guys, in terms of voice acting, this video was quite difficult for me. I freaked out several times, struggling to pronounce a sentence right. Because hell knows what was happening. Apparently magnetic waves in combination with aligned planets, I don't know. Something went wrong and I voiced it for quite a long time. Therefore, it'll be even more pleasant for me if you drop a like for this work. Share the video with your friends and, of course, scribble something in the comments. Of course, if you want to see the next part.